Welcome to like the last session of this Phosphor G conference. Thank you so much to all the organizers and the speakers who have chosen to uh, join us at this time. Um, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing uh, Bridget. Just going to welcome to like the last session of this Phosphor G conference. And I've gradually suppressed the feedback loop, which is amazing. <laughs> Bridget, we're going to start like exactly on time because this video gets cut off. Um, sure. Anything you want to say off the record, now's your chance. Right, off the record. Uh, gee, now you've got me on the spot. That's no. The, that's the idea. I want to <laughs> you right before your talk. Um, okay, so I'm going to add your screen to the, um, the presentation. So if you want to go into full screen mode. All right, and I'll go into screen mode now. Dun, 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 dun. Great. So people in the chat, I encourage you to clap early and often and offer random commentary and all of that. Participation is included at phosphor G. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, we're, morning. We're not, we're not quite live yet. Oh, oh all right. <laughs> Okay, you, you tell me, Jody. So, sorry, we're live, but we are not recording yet. I have to wait for the clock to come on. Dun, 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 dun. This is the awkward silent stage of the presentation. I'm expecting some feedback from the chat on this. So, oh, we're getting greetings. Yeah, if you're watching this chat, please introduce yourself and say hi and support Bridget. We would love that. Okay. Welcome to the afternoon session, everyone. Bridget is joining us from South Africa to look at teaching with phosphor G software in the secondary school system. She's embraced our online existence um, by moving to a Zoom town outside of Cape Town where she enjoys whale watching <laughs> and dodging her husband's mapping drones. Bridget, thank you for speaking today. Over to you. Thanks, Jody. And morning, afternoon, and often, and um and it could be lunchtime for many of you. Um, I'm a geography teacher, but I've been dabbling with GIS for gee, over 30 years and I've learned a, long, um, a lot on the way. And I just recently went back to university. So I'm going to be giving a presentation on a, a paper that's about to be published. I'll share that link right at the end. So what I did is this is going to be an evaluation of the use of GIS and open data in secondary schools, which I think is very important because a lot of you in industry, this is the foundation of where you get your future employees from. Um, and also those in tertiary. So I've realized that a lot of what we are experiencing here in South Africa, which is defined as a developing country, there are many similarities around the world. So um, firstly, just doing the good lit review that we all do when we study. Um, according to Milson in in 2012, these were the countries, a good GIS map there showing where GIS is taught in secondary school, um, the core GIS skills. And just looking at the research, I was able to add nine more countries. But of course, I'm sure there are many countries that uh, many of you could be coming from, and they probably omitted. And that is because um, a lot of research at secondary level is not being published. And that causes a bit of problem because that prevents a lot of collaboration and sharing at secondary school level. It's a lot easier at tertiary. So I'm going to firstly start off by giving a quick overview of the status of GIS education in South Africa. And here I'm actually going to have a proudly South African moment because I think we're actually doing pretty well. Um, so because firstly, South Africa's GIS curriculum is one of the few that actually includes some of the core geoprocessing skills where we actually require our students, we call them pupils, to um, acquire their own data, manage the data, deal with issues such as the ethics behind it, data security, um, and the management manipulation, and then the analysis of the data. Um, 
what the curriculum content, this is just a, a graph from some of the findings. Don't worry about all the numbers there. But uh, sadly, very few teachers are actually teaching a lot of these core skills practically. So the theory is being taught, but seldom do you actually get um, GIS being used to extend the curriculum. And I was fortunate enough to have a very dynamic team. I was in the classroom up until April and at St. John's College. Here you can see two of my ex-students project, Cameron and Nick, um, who did a study of a drainage basin, the Vol drainage basin, and they were working out the bifurcation ratio to see the extent of flood damage, which was actually quite nice for them to actually use QGIS to go beyond just purely understanding the concept of geomorphology and the theory. So the methodology of my study, uh, it was a mixed methods approach. So I got um, sent out an online questionnaire and my sample size was 112 teachers. And then I, I then the uh, qualitative study is I then went and drilled down and interviewed nine teachers. So just a good locational uh, show, those of you that have been to South Africa, um, most of them were from Gauteng, but I tried to get a national spread uh, um, and we've got two main examination boards, the Independent Examination Board and the Department of Basic Education, IEB and the DBE. I tried to get a range of different types of schools and as much as I could, um, a range of provinces in South Africa and a range of teaching experience because there's a lot of teacher angst when it comes to, um, there's a fear of tech, which I think you can see this is Dear Judy, there, <laughs> hugging onto a filing cabinet, because one of the biggest hurdles to teaching GIS in the classroom is this fear of technology. I've just jotted down a few, and this is not only reading the research, but what I found interviewing the teachers and from the um, quantitative study as well. The lack, of course, we have a lack of resources, both in terms of hardware and software, data access in South Africa in particular is very very expensive. Um, internet con uh, connectivity is intermittent. Power supply is intermittent. We have a concept called load shedding. Zimbabwe, friends of mine, our neighboring country, they haven't had power for the last two days. Um, and another big hurdle, which uh, I didn't experience myself, but and that is IT support. And at school level, very few IT administrators want to give admin rights for teachers to go and download their own software. Teacher skills and a lack of teacher training came up um, as one of the, the top hurdles. And of course, the fear and the, and the lack of motivation. Also, the status of geography at schools. It's not seen as a science. And of course, time trying to finish the curriculum. But what I found very evident just doing, going back to university, that was my 50th uh, birthday gift to myself, as all mothers do. When your children leave school and go to university, there's big competition <laughs> as to who's going to get their M before anybody else. But what was very obvious is that these hurdles are global and they span across both, both the developed and the developing world. Um, what did help, interestingly enough, is COVID. COVID actually improved teachers and students' tech skills because all of a sudden we were thrown in um, in no time to having to teach online and um, or the hybrid teaching model. And all of a sudden, teaching GIS became very relevant. Here you can see an example. Um, there's a little house there in that map. Beverly Gardens is where I used to live. And we had this five kilometer radius. I know there are places in Australia that have just enforced this with um, restrictions on movement um, during lockdown. And all of a sudden, I know there are a lot of apps that have been developed that do this. But this became a nice classroom project where every student was able to work out their own five kilometer radius of their house and where they could move. So some of the research results, I asked one of the questions. I'm just going to comment on a few of them. Um, I asked what would make GIS more accessible to teachers. And one of the key areas was access to local data, which is very important when I discuss OpenStreetMap 
later. Um, the other findings is that only 7% of the respondents use GIS frequently. And I defined frequently as those that use GIS practical classes more than once a term. The most common technique to digitize was using paper GIS followed by Google Earth. And only around 11% of teachers use um, have heard of OpenStreetMaps. But what is interesting in South Africa is that more teachers use QGIS than some of the proprietary um, products out there. Um, I think that might be a little bit of an influence of some of us that are, are pushing that. The, the next thing I did in my study is we did an evaluation of open, open street map in the classroom. And this was a game changer for myself as an educator that has been trying to teach GIS in the classroom for a number of years. Accessing local data can be a huge hurdle, hurdle. and when students are able to map areas and um, especially when it comes to collaborative mapping and crowdsource mapping, they learn you can just use OpenStreetMap to teach the entire curriculum from concepts of your attribute tables, um, adding in data, making it rich, checking that you haven't got some fool changing the name of the one rugby um, stadium to another name, which we had, and they were able to use this data for their own research. So I'm going to touch on that a little bit later, but um, just to share that after I submitted this research, um, the, some of the solutions that I implemented from these findings, and in fact, this was only, um, I've got a glass of wine here because um, uh, this is in celebration at six o'clock in South Africa and we've got jolly good wine. So um, to celebrate that we actually today uh, a certificate in geospatial data science um, by the independent exam board has, has been given the go ahead. So that means our grade 11 pupils will be able to do this at school, uh, do a robust project um, endorsed by um, uh, one of the universities here, and that's going to really promote GIS. We've managed to get industry involvement as well, accredited teacher courses, um, confirm a GIS Olympiad, run ma uh, mapathons, and then what I learned from the last Dar es Salaam Phosphor G when I met all the geo chickas, and that really inspired me, is in South Africa we have started the geo in Tombi group. In Tombazana um, is Isisulu and Kosa for uh, women, and I want to introduce you to four inspiring la um, young Geo and Tombi that have given webinars, visited schools, gone to teacher conferences and are helping teachers upskill. Um, you can even see there's a, um, a Geo Chica sticker on the one um, laptop over there. So this is what Phosphor G does. You inspire the likes of um, mere teachers as myself. And we've also run very successful mapathons. After Dar es Salaam, I got every single grade nine mapping for a cause. So thank you to HOT. We had a club called Mad Mappers. We've done quite a few community projects. And then the certificate in geospatial data science. Here's an example of what one of my students produced as a grade 12 project before OpenStreetMaps, where he actually digitized all of this from aerial photography. Of course, he didn't have to do that. And I'm very pleased to say that he studied GIS and actually was an intern in Cartosa last year, um, which is also very exciting. Some of the reflections um, are, you can see this is during COVID. We recently ran a course in KwaZulu-Natal here. But the, one of the limitations to the study uh, is that I was only able to interview teachers and get the opinions of teachers. I couldn't to students because of ethics and um, the paperwork and the quagmire of stress trying to interview minors. But I think that would probably be um, a, a very uh, going forward, somebody taking that on, and also to expand GIS intervention to disadvantaged communities. I've mainly, up until April, taught at very privileged schools. I've now changed that now that I'm online, and we are rolling out GIS in areas of Delft and Kailicha in the Cape Flats here. And I can tell you that the students grade nine at grade nine level are very excited. Uh, we also need to create platforms where teachers can collaborate and partner with each other to share um, 
GIS-based practice, but not only locally, um, regionally, and to actually start at secondary, to invest in secondary, that will benefit tertiary and that will uh, benefit the industry as well. But the biggest um, outcome from my study is that we actually need more research. We need more research to be done in this field. And one of my recommendations is to test the effectiveness of online teaching, where we could have MOOCs, um, online courses, and um, use FOSS tools um, to enable all students from a range of schools um, to access good learning across the developed and the developing world. And um, even in the next slide, when you can see one of my ex-students, looks like he's half asleep, but he was having a bit of a snooze break. But we, here we, um, and if you can see the screen, we are doing Cristala's theory of uh, central place theory, for all good geographers know about that. But the students honestly love GIS and it really grew the subject and, um, now that I've left the classroom, I'm now going into teacher training and hopefully we'll take this to another level within SADC and Southern Africa. And I would love any opportunities. Thank you to partner. Um, I'm also the founder of SACTA, which is the Southern African Geography Teachers Association. And my other little sideline, I call it a side hustle, is I work for, uh, well, I've also the founder of Think Teacher, because teachers, there's a massive attrition with teachers around the globe. So Think Teacher is going to be giving benefits to teachers so that we all don't retire at 50. And um, secondly, we're using a lot of young teachers in the first five years they are leaving. And if you look at the Time magazine, what was on the front cover last month, um, if you want to teach in certain places around the world, you need at least one or two other jobs because teachers are paid terribly and we need to inspire teachers and um, we need teachers to be enthused to teach GIS. Thank you. I raced through that because I, I was very conscious that uh, it was the graveyard shift and that there might be some Q&A. Thanks, Jody. Well, Stop sharing. You, you did race through that. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> As all good teachers do. <laughs> good, good thing I was still in the room. Well, I was going to just ask you a question about the central place theory, because I... Yes. I come from a computer science background and I have no idea what that is. And I've asked the chat room to supply questions to save you from more awkward things for me. <laughs> Shame, okay. Um, I might just have to get the hide help sitting next to me to hopefully ask a question. Um, um, we do have a couple place. questions, but yes. Okay. Uh, so the first one is, how do you motivate teachers to incorporate GIS? And so other than COVID, what is your answer? So, Jody, I missed that. There was a bit of feedback there. Oh, sorry. Um, how do you motivate teachers to incorporate GIS? Oh, gosh. Um, difficult. And I think one of the, the key things is if you actually um, allow them to attend conferences so they can actually see Oh, the question is coming up now, marvellous. But that's very difficult and a very good question. I found over the years, um, sometimes you need to bypass the teacher and go directly to the student and to the pupil because often the teachers are just so drained and exhausted. They're not interested in implementing new technology. But I think um, if you motivate the teachers, you need to incentivize the teachers, and also you need to test GIS in the final year assessment, which we are doing. And that's why we're also having a practical assessment that is going to be a requirement for this new GIS certificate, because then that will really motivate the teachers, to be honest. So it's often if it's not assessed, it's not taught. So, mm. but of course, um, you know, what everyone wants to hear is, you know, all the fluffy stuff. What you want to do is so that the teachers will see the benefits. But I think that, that during COVID, a, a lot of teachers have had to upskill and that has really alleviated a lot of the fear behind using technology. I realized that my timer was actually a bit wrong. It added 10 minutes to it. That's probably why I was racing through the presentation. We're doing just, we're doing just <laughs> one. We do have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so the first 
The next one is teaching GIS in the global south sustainable, considering lack of resources, funds, networks, and hardware. Is there a compromise? I think absolutely it is. And um, especially with mobile devices, there's so much that you can do with a mobile device. Um, recently, we've been using Mergen and Input for the students to actually access data. And there's lots that you can do. Um, using OpenStreetMaps is marvelous because then you don't need to have the IT um, supervisor at your school um, giving you admin rights. You can just go online. However, you need to log in. And I have experienced a few hurdles now with um, some people that are locked in, for example, um, uh, Microsoft uh, sometimes when they've got a they can't uh, they aren't able that they, uh, they don't want the students to use their private email address because uh, and you can understand that child protection they want to protect the children so we really need a once off login please if anyone has got the ear to anyone at OpenStreetMap so we're able to use this more as a resource but to that I think I've only answered the first part of that question but it most certainly is sustainable because because in South Africa, we have taught GIS with hardly any resources during power cuts, no funds, hardly any network and hardware, and we've made a plan. Um, as our president says, we are like the fan boss. We're incredibly resilient. So you can always find an excuse with hurdles. We just tend to concentrate on the solutions. And I think South Africans by nature are. We are solution driven because we have to be. And that means that we find a solution and have to be very innovative. And that's why FOSS tools are so good. So we don't need, you're not paying for them. They're accessible, they're user friendly. And there's of course so many, so much support out there, far more than this time five years ago. Okay, uh, that kind of dovetails into the next question. Uh, connect. Uh, Connected to teaching GIS in the Global South, do you have experience of difficulties when reusing materials? Could we improve this or at least tag materials with um, internet resources uh, and requirements would help? The question got a bit long for the Yes, sure. No, I understand that. And that is a big problem with reusing material, especially when it's um, um, designed for a developed country. So in order to grab the student's attention and for the teachers to be motivated to actually teach it, it has to be local. We need local data. Hence, OpenStreetMap, you can find a local um, uh, geography inquiry project, a real geographic issue, use, find a mapping solution, a spatial solution using GIS. So it would be a good idea to tweak some of the material, but sometimes we have a problem with uh, competency for teachers. And um, if material was Creative Commons, then that would be nice, so you can adapt it. Often that doesn't happen. Um, and that is why the South African Teachers Association, we've got a whole GIS page where we share resources. And I know that Cartosa, I've actually put all my resources that I've developed under Creative Commons on the Cartosa site and, and anyone's welcome to use it, but not to sell it. I have actually had to speak to people that are using my material and, and selling it on, but I, that happens everywhere. Understood. Do you know if students continue using all this after finishing their studies? I can only, uh, yes, I, um, they have and they do. If they're not studying um, GIS as a core course, they're definitely using it and contacting um, GIS specialists to find solutions, especially the students that have gone into engineering, civil engineers, chemical engineers, system engineers. So they're realizing that this is a key tool and we don't have the skill sets here in the developing world. So I think that's very important and and another nice thing with GIS as an educator is that it teaches collaborative and project-based learning skills, which is marvelous. So they, they might not be using some of the core GIS skills, but they're definitely using what they learned, the research, the collaborative approach, and then working through a project from concept through to um, the end product. Thanks. And I think this is our final question. Um, will partnering with um, institutions provide any benefit? I know that mapathons are regularly run at the University of Pretoria. 
with Art at Art, and that's the university that we've partnered with. <laughs> we've got an excellent relationship with UP. That's where my our young my younger son is actually studying IT at the moment, and um, we've run two tech camps, and we've continued with that. And having our, um, a lot of the mapathons, we've called students from uh, Tuckies. The University of of Pretoria is has got a very enduring name called Tuckies, and we. We've actually asked their students to come along and help out at Mapathons. So partnering with tertiary institutions is key. I've now left Gauteng and we're now going to start nagging the likes of Stellenbosch and Cape Town University and Kaput to do similar. But we always need um, somebody who, and it just, we need to grab young enthusiastic teachers to take this on because a South African term is when you're tired, I'm now an old tunny, I need a succession plan, and I need to pass the baton on. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for your talk today. And it's nice you finished early. You had a lot of time to, uh, for questions. So that was great. So great, thanks, Jody. We've got like one more minute. Any final thing to say? Um, thanks to everyone for attending. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, that was wrong. <laughs> now, we did have one question come in during the break. How can I get an I'm an OSDO contributor shirt? These were given out at the Code Sprint in Boston. Um, we should probably do another round of these two t-shirts with the marketing committee because we have so many people who contribute in in so many ways. So please talk to Enoch and the marketing committee and we'll see if we can get this sorted out. Thank you.